Hello, I'm Han Guangyong, a lecturer for Dental Bean. In this session, I will discuss the diagnosis and treatment of deep bite, one of the problems that often challenges us in clinical practice. If we look at the relationship between the maxillary and mandibular incisors from a sagittal view, the maxillary incisors overlap the mandibular incisors from top to bottom. Typically, maxillary incisors sit in front of mandibular incisors. So, the horizontal overlap, anterior to posterior, where the maxillary incisors are ahead of the mandibular incisors, is what we call overjet. And then, the vertical overlap, where the maxillary incisors cover the mandibular incisors, is what we call overbite. Normally, the incisal edge of the mandibular incisors occludes with the cingulum of the maxillary incisors. When about 1 to 3 millimeters of the clinical crown length of the mandibular incisors is covered by the maxillary incisors, we call that a normal overbite. However, as the size of teeth varies from person to person, we typically categorize it as a normal overbite if approximately one-third of the mandibular incisor's clinical crown length is obscured. In clinical practice, such cases are frequent. Maxillary incisors excessively overlapping mandibular incisors. We refer to these instances as a deep bite. To set a guideline, if the mandibular incisors are obscured by approximately five millimeters or more, or if over 30 to 40 percent of the total clinical crown length of the mandibular incisors is covered, we categorize that as a deep bite. However, in our clinical practice, instead of precise millimeter standards, we often find ourselves unable to position the bracket such that its slot is optimally located on the labial surface of the mandibular incisors when initially attempting to bond orthodontic appliances. This is because the maxillary incisors are covering the mandibular ones, in that case, we would naturally consider it a deep bite and proceed with treatment. And it's not just at the start of treatment. If the maxillary incisors begin to excessively overlap the mandibular incisors at any point during orthodontics, we must then diagnose it as a deep bite and apply the appropriate treatment strategy. Although a deep bite primarily concerns the relationship of the maxillary and mandibular incisors, these incisors are, of course, influenced by the relationship of the canines and posterior teeth situated behind them. Thus, compared to class 1 or 3, class 2 naturally presents an increased overjet as the entire maxillary arch is positioned anterior to the mandibular arch. Thus, with an elevated overjet, the mandibular incisors surge upward while the maxillary incisors descend, greatly escalating the potential for a deep bite. This explains why the majority of deep bite cases are much more common in class II malocclusions. In 1950, Dr. Strang defined deep bite as a closed bite, contrasting it with open bite, and he proposed two etiological theories for its development. One of these involved the buccal teeth, which refers to the posterior teeth. He stated that a deep bite can occur due to infraeruption of the posterior teeth, whether in the maxilla or mandible. The second etiology he mentioned was that a deep bite can also result from the supra-eruption of the anterior teeth, again, in either the maxilla or mandible. This implies that, taking the mandibular posterior teeth as an example, if they are not vertically erupted to what we consider a normal height, but are rather infra-erupted, a disocclusion between the maxillary and mandibular posterior teeth will consequently occur. Patients naturally must close their mouths for chewing or even swallowing, which causes the mandible to rotate in a counterclockwise direction as it shuts. As the mandible closes, the mandibular incisors are excessively covered by the maxillary incisors, leading to this deep bite. In another case, even if the vertical position of the posterior teeth isn't a big problem, the anterior teeth might be supra-erupted. For example, if the mandibular curve of SPI is very deep, causing the mandibular incisors to supra-erupt, this also manifests as a deep bite. This means that, whether in the maxillary or mandibular arch, a deep bite can similarly manifest due to either infra-eruption or supra-eruption of the teeth involved. However, Dr. Strang's definition gives us a great many important clues regarding the various treatment approaches. This implies that if a deep bite results from the infra-eruption of posterior teeth or the supra-eruption of anterior teeth, then our treatment strategy should directly reverse these conditions. Therefore, a deep bite can be effectively managed by either extruding the posterior teeth or, conversely, by intruding the anterior teeth. So, why exactly must we treat a deep bite? 
Of course, it's partially because effective orthodontic treatment becomes impossible if the deep bite persists. However, when we need to explain the compelling reasons for treating a deep bite to our patients, we can articulate approximately three main justifications. Firstly, due to the excessive coverage of the mandibular incisors by the maxillary incisors, the patient's expression may appear somewhat restricted and artificial when speaking or smiling. Secondly, if this deep bite condition is left untreated for an extended period, the mandibular incisors will strike the lingual gum tissue behind the maxillary incisors, potentially leading to the breakdown of the periodontal tissue there. It can be severely damaged. When this happens, as patients reach their 40s or 50s, we sometimes see the maxillary incisors flare out significantly and develop severe mobility. Thirdly, since the maxillary incisors completely overlap and conceal the mandibular incisors, the entire mandibular dental arch becomes trapped by the maxilla, thereby impeding mandibular movement. This can consequently lead to significant functional limitations, restricting the mandible's natural range of motion and causing various functional problems. Therefore, for these particular reasons, we really must persuade the patient and move forward with the deep bite treatment, mustn't we? Well then, when is the appropriate time to address a deep bite within comprehensive orthodontic treatment? I'd like to discuss the appropriate timing. Typically, comprehensive orthodontic treatment involving brackets and wires can be broadly categorized into three distinct phases. This is something I've actually discussed previously. Typically, the initial phase involves leveling and alignment, which entails affixing brackets and inserting wires to bring the teeth into proper alignment. Subsequently, if premolar extractions are performed in extraction orthodontics, the second phase is the space closure stage, during which we close these spaces and progressively achieve a class one key relationship for the canines and posterior segments. The third stage, after space closure is complete and the key relationship is mostly established, involves finishing to achieve better interdigitation, followed by the retention phase to maintain the occlusion we've created. So we commonly refer to the three stages of comprehensive orthodontic treatment as leveling and alignment, space closure, and finishing and retention. But among these stages, when should we address the deep bite? Ideally, deep bite correction should occur precisely in the initial phase, the leveling and alignment stage. Why is this the case? As I mentioned earlier, deep bite is overwhelmingly common in class two malocclusion. And because it's class two, there's a very high need to move the maxillary incisors backward. 